Welcome to episode 120 of the Civil War Practice Club podcast. Once again, I'm joined by Mary, a woman who was hoping Ho Ho Howard shows up on Christmas Eve and to fill her stocking full of IPAs. I am, I am merely a frustrating string of defective Christmas lights named Darren. Happy Howard days, Mary. How are you? <laughs> I thought you said we weren't going to mention Howard in this episode. Well, we got to get him somehow. I mean, God, God <laughs> you were all worried I was going to start talking about it. And then Howard was at Pickett's Mill. He was at Pickett's Mill. He was at Pickett's Mill. So what's going on? How are you? What's going on? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing fantastic, Mary. I'm doing just great. It's the first time we recorded just us in a while. We had Dr. Varon on with us last time. Yeah. And now we're back just in the saddle again, uh, back and doing this again. And now we're going to be having some fun as we are approaching the holidays. And everybody's in a good mood. Christmas and all the other holidays are in the air. And so we are recording again. Well, this episode might not be. It might be kind of depressing in the end. Well, that's just, the guy's is life it is. is not exactly thrilling. And it doesn't no, we'll, end. We'll, Spoiler we'll alert, it did not end well for him. No, no, it, 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 it didn't. It didn't. But we will talk about him in just a moment. I'm going to be a gracious host because I don't forget to do this. And I will ask you, what by happenstance are you happening to be drinking tonight on this um, Friday night? I am drinking Haze Glare IPA from New Belgium brewing and i'm drinking it on my chickamauga mug because although the general we're going to talk about not a huge role in chickamauga he is still there at chickamauga okay okay yeah they're real exciting what are you drinking oh i i really didn't think you were asking i'm i'm going traditional going yingling here with the, the great the great nectar of pennsylvania and i'm drinking out of my peewee herman mug who, although he did not fight in the Civil War, Mary, he was the one has a Texas relation because he was the one who discovered there was a basement in the Alamo in Texas, hence Pee Wee Herman Mug. Nice. So there we go. So, I was going of, to try and find us Texas beer tonight at Total Wine, but I didn't think that. Uh, <laughs> I was okay. like, what can I get us to drink that is from Texas? When I, kind of, you know, that I was, when, I was, when I was living down there, Mary, which I did, we drank Lone Star. Which was horrible beer made out of Texas, but it was it was Texas. But yeah. but in any case, so speaking of Texas, we are going to be talking sp- not specifically Texas. We're going to be talking about uh, the Confederate General Hiram Granberry. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, to most, he is not a household name like a Lee nor a Grant, but his story is really one that epitomizes really many, you know, on both sides who fought and died without a lot of notoriety. Now. Granberry was a man who, who most of the time people considered a real strong leader. Mm-hmm. And he died, he died that tragic death in the late stage of the war at the Battle of Franklin, and in which we just we've men said many times, in hindsight, is probably a kind of a waste of life. Yeah. Um, and you know, he's a guy like a lot of them. He he didn't attend West Point, nor did he have really any military training, but but due to that natural leadership ability. He's going to rise through the ranks and he's going to earn the reputation of being one of the best young fighters in the war on either side. So he's a, another guy. I don't want to say he's nameless or someone who is, is kind of on that level, but he's somebody who I think when you kind of dig deep and start to go deep into these rabbit holes, there are a lot of Hiram Granberries out there. But his story is so personal and so tragic that I think it's one that I think a lot of people are going to enjoy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, as I, you know, I knew going into this how sad his story, like his, it is like, honestly, it's a sad story. It's an interesting one, though. Um, But as you said, he's a really great leader. Um, and that could come from the fact that he's really tall for his his time. Some sources say he was 6'2", some say he was 6'5". And he had a very deep voice that was like, so he was able to project his voice. And he just came across as a leader. And when he was at Oakland college, which is a Presbyterian college near Rodney, Mississippi, where he started going to school, his, his professors and fellow students said that, you know, they would remark, wow, this guy's a natural leader. He's incredibly intelligent. He's a very good writer. He's considered to be a scholar. Um, and he's just one of these guys that, as you said, like he doesn't go to West point, um, just like John Brown Gordon doesn't go to West point, but he comes out of this, you know, he gets a reputation for being a really hard fighter even in battles that are do not go well for the Confederacy, as we're going to learn. No, and he, he, again, in his, his comparison to John Brown Gordon is an interesting one. There are a lot of parallels. So let's jump into this guy. Hiram Br- Bronson Granberry Mary is born on March 1st of 1831 in Capaya County, Mississippi. He was the son of Norville and Nancy Granberry. And we'll talk about that. Norville was a Baptist minor, minister who was also a slave-owning farmer, right? Mm-hmm. And when Hiram was about four years old, 
you know, give or take, the family's going to move to Hines County, which is not far from the town of Raymond, which you just mentioned in Mississippi, where he'll become, where later on in life, he'll be familiar with that, that part of the country as yeah. well. Now, he attended Presbyterian College first, but then in 1850, he's going to end up going and graduating from the prestigious Oakland College, Mary, which is on mm. the right on the river town of Rodney, Mississippi. Oakland College, just by the by, it's, it folds in 1870, goes under. And that ground that the college was on is actually on the historically black campus today of Alcorn State, if you know Alcorn mm. State University, which generated such NFL alums such as Steve McNair, also Leslie Frazier. So it's interesting that um, it's got a little parallel, especially the all-black college. Yeah. 1850 also is going to hit Granbury with a bunch of personal tragedies as well. He's going to lose both of his parents to tuberculosis within about a five-month period, as well as the death of two of his sisters, Jemima and Catherine, mm -hmm. both in their early 20s and both were newlyweds. So it's going to leave him with three siblings left. And, and, and not it doesn't come into the story, but he loses a lot of his family. Yeah. Around age 21, Granberry is going to move to Texas, and he's going to change the spelling of his last name from Granberry to Granberry, G-R-A-N-B-U-R-Y. And the thing about it, there's no real record of why. There's some speculation that he already had an uncle in Texas named Granberry and wanted to separate. But there's also speculation that people were – he was tired of people misspelling his name. So he changed it to the phonetic spelling of Granberry. I, as a guy, me – I'll tell you point blank, I can relate because 99% of people spell my first name wrong. Yeah. So I kind of understand that concept. Yeah. And Granberry, one of Granberry's surviving sisters is the only one who actually writes about it. And she's going to basically say that in her memoirs that his name change was a whim and did it for no particular reason. Yeah, he did it when he was, um, she said it, her name was Naughty, and she said he did it when he was a teenager, so it was one of those kind of, like, I wondered when I read that about her, I was like, was this some kind of act of rebellion of his? Did he have kind of not a great relationship with his parents where he was like, I just want to whatever, or did he not just, was he lazy and didn't feel like putting in as many letters? It's it's just tough to say, but he's going to move to a town called Seguin, Texas, which is just east of San Antonio, if you know the area. He's going to purchase a plot of land at the corner of Austin and West Court Street, where he's going to set up shop to become a lawyer. Now, unfortunately for Granberry, his first foray into practicing law was about as successful as a new attempt dry January. So it did not work whatsoever. What? But by all accounts, though, he did enjoy Texas. And he says Granberry of Texas, nowhere is a worthy stranger made more welcome than here in Texas. So he was definitely loved being in Texas. Yeah, it sounds now, like he made his his home there. That was one thing that I kind of picked up on is he's one of these guys that is not necessarily born in the state, but he finds his home there. And that's got a parallel with Claiborne. Now, Claiborne is an immigrant, but he finds his home in the South as well in Arkansas. So I saw a parallel there. The, these are two guys, and Claiborne and Granbury are going to become good friends. Two guys that found their home in the place where they weren't born. Yeah. And, you know, we, when I was living down there, you used to always say, you could always tell a Texan, but you can't tell them anything. That's what you used to say all the time about Texas, right? <laughs> did they all have, but, like, crazy wild hair like Grim? <laughs> I don't know. He may have. But, you know, he did He did get his law degree at Baylor University at law school. He did pass the bar, but he obviously still needed a little bit of practice. So in 1852, mm -hmm. Granberry is going gonna, is gonna to move to McLennan County, which is in central Texas, near the town of Waco. And he's going to join Waco's Masonic Lodge number 92. And that's going to be a big part of his life. I'll talk about that later. Waco, of course, Mary, is the home of Dr. Pepper. I don't know if you know this, but it's invented by Charles Alderton in 1880. That is like my which, favorite soft drink. Is Dr. I was, Pepper. It, it's, it's, it's the weirdest drink you would drink on Saturday mornings when you can't get out of bed. It's the weirdest thing how you drink that. I don't know, I don't know how that works. I've been but, into Dr. Pepper since I was like six years um, old. It's my I, favorite I, I, soft I, I, drink. I, I, can't imagine why. But it actually, the thing about it, when I was living down there, there used to be a Dr. Pepper Museum. You could actually go visit outside of, I don't know if it's still That's there. That's really cool. A, so I, who, maybe there still is. So, so anyway, his role in the lodge, is he, I read somewhere he's like a secretary. Is that one of the things that he does? There? Yeah, yeah. He, he's he's going to be the secretary initially. He's going to climb through the ranks, but he's going to be the secretary, which is basically, it's the same thing as any organization. He just took take notes and reads them and all that. But anyway, as bad as his law practice was in Seguin, you know, once he, he got to McLennan County, it really boomed. Mm -hmm. And by the age of 25, 
Hiram Granberry is elected Chief Justice of McLennan County, where he's going to serve from 1856 to 1858, uh, and was also elected, like you said, Secretary of Masonic Lodge. So his life, kind of like a Patrick Claiborne in Arkansas, yeah. is taken off, right, right off the bat. Now, he's going to quickly have the reputation in town of being a gifted scholar in the area. He's also going to write for Waco's first newspaper called the Brazo Statesman. He's going to write for that. I so he can... like the Brazo, that sounds like I'm not going to say. <laughs> okay. But he's he's going to be Brazo. he's going to be a learned man in in central Texas who can read, who can write, who's very eloquent. Mm-hmm. He and he's someone who's going to be very attractive. Now, he's like you said he's tall, he's handsome. He's got dark hair. He quickly rose to become one of the elite in Waco and McLennan County. And this is all by the age of 25 years old. This is happening, right? A local preacher named John Hutchinson described Granberry as a man of classic tastes, a commanding form, and a trumpet voice. That's how they described him, kind of like we were saying a little bit earlier, right? And it was around this time when Hiram is going to meet a woman seven years his younger named Fanny Sims. And they quickly became hot and heavy, mm-hmm. as they say, right? But the thing is, it was thing about Fanny. She was then and still is a mystery. She, yeah. She's what is it? And so she's she's born in Alabama. Her family still lives in the Tuscaloosa area, right? Go Bama, by the way, football yeah. on that one, right? But no one really knows how or why. Fanny ended up in Texas. She just kind of appeared there and her family stayed there. And she's only 20 years old with, with no family and she's in, finds herself in Waco. And there's also no known photography, no pictures of her. No, no I've, of I've her. been looking around for pictures of her because I know like, you know, she's described as being like, you know, small, which I guess if your husband or future husband, Granberry is six two, of course, <laughs> she's probably going to be small. So um, but apparently she's, I've got one story I'm going to tell about her in a little while that she's this, she's feisty. She's strong, um, despite health mm-hmm. problems that she has, she's, you know, and the two of them are very, very close and they become close very, very quickly. Right. March 31st, 1858, they are going to get married in Waco. And again, she's just 20 years old at the time. And the thing about the, of the Granberries is they had no children and it's possibly due to a medical condition that we're going to talk about in a little while, why they mm-hmm. didn't have children. But we'll get to that here in a little bit. You know, Granberry is also going to get involved in the local militia uh, around this time. And by 1860, he will be serving as a lieutenant with the Texas Rangers, not the baseball team mm-hmm. area, the militia group, right? And so he's going to be rising now. This is going to be his military education. Like in many parts of the South, Texas was in the midst of that secession crisis, right? And just, just after 11 o'clock in the morning on February 1st, 1861, and despite the pleas of its 67-year-old governor, Sam Houston, Texas is going to overwhelmingly vote to secede and become the seventh state to leave the Union for the Confederacy, mm-hmm. right? So Granberry, much like the guy we mentioned a little bit ago, John Brown Gordon, he's that natural leader and that, that prominent local individual. He's going to begin to recruit and raise a company of 100 Waco men, which is the standard number for a company, and he's going to fight for a group called the Waco Guards. Mm. And just like the raccoon Russell Gordon, the parallels, I love the names. lawyers, almost exactly the same. So despite no military education, nor any real military background, which wasn't that unusual at the time, obviously, no. Hiram Granberry is going to become captain of the Waco Guards heading into the secession crisis. And, you know, and just you, like you said a while ago, just imagine he stood out. He was tall. You know, he you, he was between 6'2 and 6'5, depending on who you read, yeah. like you said before. He was thin, though. He only weighed about 160 pounds. Yeah. He all he had that black wavy hair. Like he, he looked like that kid who always forgot to wear his comb, bring the comb yeah. on picture day at first yeah. grade. His hair is just wavy all over the place. But on October 2nd of 1861. Granberry and his Waco guards are going to find themselves in the town of Hopkinsville, Kentucky, Mary, and they're going to join nine other companies to create the 7th Texas Infantry under the command of a district judge from Fairfield, Texas, named John Gregg. Yes. And so you know, is- who's with them is Fanny. Fanny goes right. with, with her husband, just like John Brown Gordon's wife went with him. Fanny um, 
Granberry is with her husband while he's at war. She's going to follow him. Now, because of these leadership abilities, the way he stood out, Granberry is going to be elected to become the regiment's major, third in, third in charge now um, on the pecking order. And it just kind of showed how highly that Granberry was thought of among his men. The seven Texas over these next couple of years will become Texas as one of Texas's best and most fighting regiments in the Civil War. We'll talk about that. So Hiram, he's, he's set off for Kentucky with his, with his, in the army with his wife, Fanny. She's refusing to go. She's going to stay. She's not going to stay behind in Waco. Yeah. She's going to follow him along. And basically wherever – she's going to stay in local hotels, anywhere close to the Confederate camp, she's going to try to stay because she wants to be near Hiram, right? Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, um, and there's no record about Hiram thought of that, admittedly. But this, I get. Like, I'm gonna guess, judging by their relationship, that he was okay with it. The same way that Gordon was okay with his wife being there too. Like I think they just, you know, they were companions, and you know, Fanny just was like, well, whatever. They hadn't been married for that long either. You know, I'd probably do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you would. But on February 9th of 1862, the 7th Texas is going to march through Clarksville, Tennessee. And, and by the 13th, are going to find themselves at Fort Donaldson. And were part of Thomas Davidson's 2nd Brigade and Gordian Pillow's left wing of the Confederate Army of Central Kentucky. We know what's going on. We know what, we're not going to go into history that, but we kind of know yeah. what's going to happen. We've done an episode um, about this. Basically, suffice it to say, awful rebel leadership by unqualified generals. John Bell, uh, John Floyd, uh, Pillow, Simon Bolivar, Buckner, they're going to cause the Rebs to basically be routed um, by U.S. Grant and that famous unconditional surrender proxy yeah. and demand the surrender of the fort on February 16th of 1862. Now, the 7th Texas is going to be one of the many regiments that are going to be bagged and captured by the Union, including their major, Hiram Granberry. Yeah. Right. So many of the enlisted men, where they were captured, they were sent to the brand new Johnson's Island Prison Camp, Mary, which opened in April of 1862 in Sandusky, Ohio. Yeah, I imagine on Lake many. Erie. I imagine many of the captives were stuck in, being forced to make Callahan Auto Parts, Mary. <laughs> uh, obviously, um, never some new Polly Boy, but it's okay. That no, doesn't I matter. It doesn't matter. Okay, but to see your point, though, which is right, right across well, the bay. <laughs> Missed that joke. In any case, <laughs> but while the enlisted men were sent. Um, were on their way to Johnson's Island, the officers were spared the ungodly misery of going to Ohio and were sent to Fort Warren in Boston Harbor. Now, the Confederates were, the, 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 the officers were surprised at the humane treatment they mm -hmm. received in Boston. There were, and this is the thing about Fort Warren, there were four or five men in each chamber. Each had a heated, was heated with a coal burning stove. Every prisoner got an iron cot with a mattress and blanket. Um, and it's basically, the, and the quality of the food kind of depended on how much money you had, how rich you were, yeah. kind of, right? Yeah, they were they and, were able to buy stuff. Um, yeah. You know, and they said, like, um, I found some quotes about from Greg, because um, Greg was going there with Granberry. And, you know, who else is with them is Fanny. Fanny's like, I'm going with you. If you're going to prison, I'm coming with you. Yeah. And they basically travel from Chicago. They go through Cleveland. They go through Buffalo in order to get to Boston. And Greg said they had like, there was crowds of Yankees everywhere that he said, we, we found crowds of Yankees. Um, they were curious at every town. They gave us hard and half cooked meat. Um, hard words were to be heard at our receptions, but there were many everywhere who disposed to argue the question with us. And they talked kindly enough. Now they came to a point where they had to cross the Hudson and this is what um, McGavick is in our Colonel Randall McGavick is another officer that is traveling with them. And he said, major Granberry of Texas had his wife traveling with him, a small and delicate woman, but she waded through the shock of ice uh, on the ice, like a heroine and seemed determined to cling to the fortunes of her husband. So here's this small and delicate woman and she's waiting uh, through icy water she's going over ice with her husband and these guys and they yeah. and it sounds like you know this guy's saying she's a heroine for doing this like so she's clearly respected she's not one of these like oh geez he brought his wife along and this guy's like holy shit this woman is like she's bad like basically she's a badass for doing this and i no. really like i love that story of her what she's having to do um and she unfortunately can't be in fort warren with granberry no. 
No, but I mean, speaking of McGavick, you know, Randall McGavick, he's a rich planter from Nashville. He's one of the richest men in the Confederacy to fight. He's not Wade Hampton rich, but yeah. he's pretty rich. He he has a quote about Fort Ward where he says, I ate so well, uh, you would think I was in a first class hotel in Boston. That's how much they took care of him. So, you know, also in, in, in also speaking of Fort Warren, you know, these officers, they were they were given alcohol of all things. Yeah. Daily daily newspapers. They got DQ gift certificates while they were there. <laughs> they, they played were allowed, chess. They right, played football. They were, they were allowed to receive gifts from the outside, including books and food. I mean, this was this was, I mean, they were they were taken care of. Now, the thing about it though, Fort Donaldson was the first real mass capture of the civil yeah. war. So I imagine the union brass kind of didn't know how to deal with captives in the situation. So, but they took care of these officers and, and treated them very, very well. Fort Meyer, I mean, Fort Warren, by the way, it's, a, it's just to give an idea. If you haven't been here, it's 28 acres of a prison that was built on Georgia's Island of Boston Harbor. It's about six miles out and away from the city. Um, during the civil war, it was home to such Confederate generals such as Isaac Trimble, Simon Bolivar, Richard Yule, as well as Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens. It's also where John Brown's body, the song, was written. Yeah. Um, it was also the inspiration, Mary, of Leonardo DiCaprio's Shutter Island movie. Yes. That, that's where it takes place in, in that movie as well. But um, but the thing, like you said before, you know, when Hiram's going to Boston, you know, Fanny is also going to ship up to Boston too. She's yeah. going to make sure that she's with him. And what's interesting about this though, when U.S. Grant, who bagged them all for Donaldson, yeah. when he hears that Fanny is going with them and crawling, going across the Hudson like she's doing, he is going to personally find her an apartment in the city of Boston to stay in. He's going to find it. Even back then, it was impossible to find a damn place in the city. <laughs> but Grant, but Grant actually, Grant actually did, and also he made sure that while he was, she was getting settled that Hiram was temporarily paroled and released to be with her to make sure she was settled in the city oh. with a with a promise that when she got all situated to go back to the island, which, of course, he did. Yeah. I mean, no word if Fanny's truck, a moving truck, got stuck on the Star Road Drive or a bridge right. Star Road. I mean, if you, know, if, you know, if you know the area, you know what I mean by that. But, but, but he helped. This just kind of goes to show how they took care of them. They made sure it was. And, you know, for the most part, Fanny's there. It's cold. They're from the South. And she's, you know, she's going to start to get sick. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And she's going to start writing letters to her husband of Fort Warren. Don't forget, they can receive mail. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where the story kind of takes a turn for Granberry. You know, his cellmate in Boston was a political prisoner from Hagerstown, Maryland. His name was Charles McGill. He was a doctor. He was also the co-founder of the Hagerstown Herald, as well as a general and the Confederate militia in Maryland. McGill was arrested at his home in Hagerstown on September 30th of 1861 for pro-Confederate activities, whatever the hell that means. And he's going to be sent to Fort Warren as a political prisoner. Now, McGill, you know, he also, you know, he, he, he was a doctor and he took great interest in Fanny's letters because Hiram would read him the letters. And McGill being a doctor is trying to Figure out what the heck's wrong with her. Yeah. Because he's in and, and at first they thought that it was just the climate. You know, she's she's yeah. up here in the north, it's cold. But then he started thinking it, it maybe, you know, maybe it wasn't. And and he feared, you know, that what she had, what will be known today as ovarian cancer. And he urged Hiram to send Fanny from Boston to his family's home in Hagerstown to stay with them. Mm -hmm. And and that's the thing, is Fanny's plight became the primary subject of Charles's letters home. Um, on March 7th of 1862, McGill is going to write, Major Granberry of Texas is rooming with us. How I felt for him when he informed me of his lady, but 20 years old, had followed him. She will leave Boston tomorrow morning and will arrive in Hagerstown, Maryland. So he convinced her to go, to go back. A few months later, on, July, on June 27th, he writes, I feel very sure she is suffering from ovarian enlargement of a dropsy in character. The major, Granberry, has just received a letter from his lady, and I am pleased to say that she has very much improved. Hmm. Okay, so, so yeah. who knows? Um, soon, though, Fanny's condition is going to get worse, and Charles, McGill the doctor, is going to beg his wife 
you got to convince Fanny to go get examined because she was refusing to get examined. I think she with- was in that regard. I mean, and I'm, I'm, men or women can relate to this. I think she was kind of like, no, there's nothing wrong. And probably feeling like, I don't want to be a bother. I'm staying at someone else's house. My husband's in prison, like in a prison camp. I, I don't want to be a bother, you know. He's going to keep writing July 15th now. I wish you'd have a talk with Mrs. Granberry and insist on her submitting to an uh, to an examination. It is impossible to arrive at the true nature of her disease without this. So McGill, by the way, he's, a, he's an inter- interesting fellow, Charles McGill. Mm-hmm. Da- his son, Charles G.W. McGill, was also a doctor in Stonewall's brigade in July of 1863. Charles, who was released at that point from Boston, and his mm-hmm. son – both set up a hospital in Hagerstown, Maryland, to deal with the Confederates after the Battle of Gettysburg, right? They both accompanied Lee's army on the retreat back to Virginia um, and remained surges in the Confederate army for the rest of the war. So they, wow. they, that's who they were, right? Um, anyways, finally, in August of 1862, Fanny is going to agree to an examination in the city of Baltimore. And it was scheduled, and she was scheduled to be operated on. Yeah. Um, now, here, here's the thing. When the Union government found out everything that's going on with this, right, um, they granted Granberry a special parole so he can go to Baltimore to be with Fanny for the surgery. So in August of 1862, Granberry is going to leave Fort Warren, and it's going to turn out to be for good. And that's thanks have, to Justin Dimmick, who is the right. – um, he's the commandant, well, the commander there. Um, and he's – interesting thing – about Dimmick is he's known for his humane and compassionate treatment of the Confederates at Fort Warren. He had been too, deemed too old for field service because he was born in 1800. Um, so he's in his sixties at the time, but his son um, is going to be killed or was killed um, at the battle of Chancellorsville. Yeah. But it goes to show that in this situation that, um, that they exchanged him August 27th, 1862, he is going to be – Hiram Grammar is going to be exchanged and released. In case you're curious, he was able to get – they got him for two union lieutenants. That was a nice. trade, okay? So it's like baseball if you keep, cards. If you keep, if you keep in like, track, right? It's like baseball cards. <laughs> yeah. But but by the time he gets to Baltimore, the doctors chose uh, not, to do the, not to do the operation, and it was determined – that her cancer was too far developed yeah. and there was nothing they could do for her. And so she, they just basically, you know, try to make her comfortable. And the thing that's tough about it was Granberry was exchanged, but he wasn't released. He still had a job to do with the army. And despite the fact that the seventh Texas was still in, in, um, in uh, Joss's Island, mm-hmm. uh, they would not be exchanged until later in that fall. Granberry while this is all going on is going to be promoted to Colonel on August 29th. So the, and here's the thing too, is like, so he has to leave. He's going to have to leave his wife again. Now, before leaving Baltimore for his return to the army, Granberry is going to stop at a place called Bendan's gallery, a top end photo studio in the city for a pose for a photograph for him of himself to give to Fanny. Mm-hmm. Now, I, and this was going to be the last, and he, he had to know, he had to know this would be the last time he was ever going to see her. So he wanted to make sure that when the end came, that she had a photo of him because he mm-hmm. knew he couldn't be there with her. And the thing about it, though, is this photo is that popular photo you see with the messy hair. Oh, is that, that everyone? That that everyone the... is, and, and, right. We, we have fun with it. But the thing about it, though, if you look at the picture closely, and you look at his eyes, you can sad. see you can see the sadness. And this was probably the saddest part of his life. So, so look at that picture. And this, and when that picture was taken, he was making that picture to give to his wife who was dying. He knew he would never see again because yeah. he knew that she wanted to have that picture. So when she died, she'd have it. Yeah. That's the history of that picture, which is which is really, really sad. And, you know, Granberry, he's going to be a colonel, but he's going to have no command. He's going to kind of bounce around a little bit in title only. Eventually, they're going to make him colonel of his old regiment, the 7 Texas, because you know why? Because John Gregg's still in prison. He's still in jail. He's still there. He he rejoins them on March the 1st, 1863, which is his 32nd birthday. And on March 3rd, they actually have a birthday party for him. And I mean, I can't imagine it's probably pretty bittersweet for him because he's not with his wife. But they had a cake, they had preserves and jelly, and they had sausages, biscuits, and coffee. And like, you know, 
and I can't, I don't know if they did that because they, they probably knew his situation. So it's like, well, let's try and cheer the poor guy up kind of thing. But still, that must have been really bittersweet for him to, you know, it's like, wow, it's my 32nd birthday and my wife is like, yeah, dying of cancer, you know. You know, by by the end, so early 1863, you know, Fanny's health is going to get worse and, and she's going to end up leaving Maryland and going back to her family's home in Alabama. I mentioned her family was in the Tuscaloosa area. He takes her back there. I think that's right. like, there's one story where he takes her back there. See, I heard he didn't take her back there. That yeah, he there's, did, so, that, there's so many different stories about it. But who knows? And so it doesn't matter. But in any case, she's going to go to Alabama to live her last days with her family on, Mar- and on March 20th, 1863, just 11 days for Fanny and Hiram are going to have their, their fifth anniversary, uh, she's going to die and from ovarian cancer. And as you can imagine, it, Hiram was absolutely devastated. It ruined the whole spring. It just, it just, it just affected yeah. him. His regiment was back on the field um, by that spring, though, because I don't know if you know this, Mary, U.S. Grant was beginning his Vicksburg campaign again on March 29th of 1863, which is going to run until July 4th, right? So – when Grant is going to land at Bruinsburg in, in, in late April, mm-hmm. you know, he's going to begin to move through Mississippi to, uh, towards Jackson, Mississippi. He's going to plan to take that city, and he's going to move to Vicksburg. He's going to take the city from the Savannah. We talked all about the whole from the Savannah. Campaign, <laughs> right? but, but, but John Gregg, at this point, he's back. Yeah. Okay. He, he, was, he, got, he got himself out. But he's now a brigadier, brigadier general under James Pemberton, right? And he'll be back from Jackson, uh, He's going to go to he's basically going to be sent from Jackson, Mississippi. This is this is uh, Greg now, the brigade to Raymond, Mississippi, to intercept what he thinks is a small Union advancing force towards Raymond. Right. Before they're all going all over the place, trying to take different places. Greg's brigade, including Granbury 7th, Texas, has about 4000 men. And to their surprise, that small Union force advancing towards Richmond. Guess what? It's James Burbsey McPherson's yep. ten thousand man Seventeenth Corps. Oops. Yep. And and then this is going to result in the Battle of Raymond on May twelfth of eighteen sixty three. I think we did an episode on. We did. Check we out did. our episode on the Battle yeah. of Raymond. <laughs> we we did so so check that out. But I mean, um, here but here though, uh, Granberry in his seventh Texas, the plan was to hit the head of the Union column mm-hmm. and hold them, grab them by the nose, and hold them until the rest of the Confederates could come, right? Yeah. And it, it, but by then they realized that the uh, the brigade was significantly outmanned. But thanks to some, some weird overcautious action by McPherson, the Rebs were able to fall back and only lose about 500 guys, even yeah. though this, the, the, it was. But that 7 Texas mayor was right in the middle, fighting hard along that 14-mile creek, that, that place they called, which is about six or so miles away at this moment from where Granbury grew up in Hines County, Mississippi, uh, Hines city rather. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of old home coming back. Right. And uh, basically, you know, two days later, the battle of Jackson, another retreat, by the way, is going to be the end of Grant's Vicksburg um, campaign. As, as far as he's concerned, as Joseph E. Johnson is going to withdraw East, where's 32,000 man army of, of, um, of relief was mm-hmm. stationed, which provided no relief whatsoever. Because if you remember, at, you know, he basically, um, by the time this 32,000-man army reached the Big Black River on July 3rd, the, the shoot match was over, and it was too late to do anything. So basically, yeah. they fell back. So, that, so there wasn't a lot of action for the 7 Texas with, with these guys here. But whenever they and, did fight, like, Granberry was noted to be, like, they were very hard-fighting guys because he was very, like, I mean, after his wife died, the one thing that was said about him is – he had one thing left to do in life, and that was basically he put everything into that that regiment and his men that and the war, well, and that's and that that's because that's what Fanny apparently would have wanted was right. that just just for him to put everything into it, and that's what he did. But the one concept of Granberry is he was always under incompetent leadership. He just yes. was right. But the so after the Vicksburg fiasco, Granberry and his seven Texas are going to be transferred. To the land of the misfit toys, remember the Army of Tennessee under Braxton yeah. Bragg. They're going to be transferred, but they're going to be joined by the 6th and 10th Texas, the 15th Texas Cavalry, as well as the 17th, 18th, 24th, and 25th Texas Cavalry to, to form what's going to be that famous Texas Brigade under the great James Argyle Smith, Mary. Yeah. Right. That's who he's going to be. 
Now, this Texas Brigade is going to be placed in a division with some guy named Patrick Claiborne. I don't know if you've heard of him. OK, and it, he's going to be in John C. Breckinridge's second corps of the Army of Tennessee. We're from September 18th to the 20th. They're going to participate in the Battle of Chickamauga, but they weren't a big part of it. Granberry about- is wounded in the um, I think he gets shot in the belly or something in this battle and he's wounded. Yeah. Right. But, but as far as far as as far as the whole the whole thing, they're going to yeah. Chattanooga is where they're going to kind of make their yeah. make their make their claim. OK. Yeah. And so for the most part. Battle. We're not going to talk about these deep battles in detail. Battle of Chattanooga, November twenty fifth, the Missionary Ridge. This is where Granberry's guys. They're going to be in that far right of the of the right flank of the Confederates, and and really, this is the first time when I think he can look up to a general and say, "This guy knows what he's doing in Claiborne," because yeah. despite the fact that the Army of Tennessee got routed at Chatt at, uh, at Chattanooga, Claiborne's line never broke. No. They they held, and and they and for the most part. They did very, very well all by reports, right? Um, and the thing about it, though, is the thing that did not go good for the Texas Brigade worked out really well for Hiram Granberry because James Argyle Smith is going to be shot and injured. Yeah. And this is when Hiram Granberry is going to be promoted to Brigadier General of the Texas Brigade, which will be known for the rest of the war, even after Granberry's death, as Granberry's Texas Brigade. Yeah. This is the, where the whole legend kind of begins with this now, right? He's going to join um, fellow Brigadier Generals, Daniel Govan, Lucius Polk, and Mark Lowry, and they're going to form a ball-busting, hard-lining all-star team for Patrick Claiborne. Yeah, these are kind of like the steel of the Confederacy, and you know, they're you know going forward, they're at many different battles where they are just absolute, like, Basically, you wouldn't want to go up against them. Like when the guys from the Union saw that flag with the, you know, it's the heart, some some call it the Hardy flag, some call it the flag of Claiborne's division. Like they knew what they were up against. And it was these guys, including Granberry. They, they were. And when the calendar flips to 1864, the Atlanta campaign is going to dominate most of the year for Army of Tennessee, yeah. right? William T. Sherman, Mayor, I don't know if you've heard of him or not. He's going to do it. Uncle Bill, the hundred mile campaign from Chattanooga to Atlanta is going to lead to several, several battles versus Joseph E. Johnson's Army of Tennessee. And the thing about it, though, is, you know, in these battles, specifically the Battle of Pickett's Mill, Granberry's Brigade really stood out and their presence really took on a cult of personality, you know, due to the reputation of being those hard fighters. Yes. Yeah, they did. And Pickett's Mill is some of we did an episode about it. Um, you know, Howard in his memoir said that it was an absolute nightmare. Um, that's the, the way he described it, this horrific fighting. And obviously, Granberry, even though he was on the winning side in this battle, he sees some pretty horrible stuff too. Um, and the battle is fought, Pickett's Mill is fought in late May of 1864. In June of 1864, Granberry is in a hospital in Atlanta for, I couldn't find what the illness was. But um, the one resource I was reading about it said that today he probably would have been diagnosed with what is clin- what today is called clinical depression, that he had kind of just reached that point where he was in the hospital for a month and he takes a leave from his regiment for this and he's, he's in Atlanta. And you have to remember all that he's been through um, in over a year, right? Like he's lost his wife and that has really really like she was his companion i would say you know she was his best friend they clearly loved each other very much and they didn't get that many years together but you know the way she died is terrible she's 25 years old when she dies but also just before pickett's mill he had learned of the death of his brother in louisiana um obviously as i said still mourning his wife the stress from campaigning the atlanta campaign has been a horrific campaign pickett's mill is a ter- terribly horrific battle as well even if you are on the confederate side which won the battle um he also had a slight head wound at pickett's mill so he might have been suffering from a concussion as well um and he's as i said treated at an atlanta hospital and he comes back in july and one of his men wrote general granberry is in camp today he has been quite sick but he says he can take command in eight or ten days and the guy that they had commanding him general smith they didn't like him said he's a brave man but he's mean as a hyena and we we're going to be glad to get Granberry back. And they apparently petitioned to have Granberry brought back. Like this is, you know, 
and this is a time when the army is starting to kind of they're starting to lose steam they're starting to lose their morale but the thing with granberry and also the thing with claiborne is there was something about them their leadership abilities whatever that the men were able to to keep their morale they were able to keep inspiring their men and that's how much these these guys were like we want you back we want this guy to be our leader um and granberry comes back in july from his stay in the hospital as i said would probably you know could quite possibly be diagnosed today as clinical depression well i mean he's young and he's dealing he's dealing with a lot of stuff he's got a lot of shit going on (laughs) not that anybody else but he's there's a lot going on and he's still in mourning he's i don't think he ever ever got over the death of his wife i think that Mm -hmm. that rocked him like so hard and back then it's like you know what are you gonna do and I think his men knew too, like he was not the same person when he came back after Fanny had died. No, but he did come back in on, everyone knows what happened on September 1st, Mary. This is when Atlanta is going to fall and John Bell Hood is now in command of Army of Tennessee for the Confederates. Now, you know, we, we talk a lot about this and I mean, a lot of people feel that Hood was very much over his skis yeah. in this role, right? And that's, we, we how talk- the, that's how it was felt in the army too, that it was right. not. You know, the guys were not happy about it, but for, you know, the one thing that kept these guys going, like Granberry's guys and Claiborne's guys was who they had as their leader, that it's like, okay, we have Hood, but at least we've still got. Yeah, and it's t- it's tough to say, I mean, a lot of these guys probably thought that he shouldn't, Hood should not have been the army of, the commander of the army of Tennessee. He probably should be managing the Jonesboro DQ instead. That's probably what he's probably better off doing. But, but the I think thing I probably it, would have fired him. <laughs> well, but I mean, but this is what, but that's, that's all debated. And that's, that's for yeah. a conversation for other people. But, but this is where the army of Tennessee was really in the fall of 1864. Atlanta's going to fall. It really was the last gasp for Southern independence. Really think about it. Since the fall of Atlanta, basically virtually locked in Abraham Lincoln's reelection campaign of 1864. And really, the whole hopes kind of fell with it. You know, that being said, though, Hood, you know, he wants to keep fighting. He wants to maintain being aggressive because that's who he is. Now, some has say his actions were desperation. Um, I mean, I think I think basically he wanted to maintain the initiative. Did not, not be passive like like his predecessor Johnson was. Yeah. Well, no. that's what date President like date Jeff Jefferson Davis wanted that as well. I think he was like you know, and as a politician, he's like we have to keep going. And the politicians, you know, this happened to Abraham Lincoln as well. The politicians aren't always completely a hundred percent in tune with what is going on in the battlefield, nor are they understanding of that. And I think that was the yeah. case with Davis that he's just yeah. like let's just keep going. You know? Exactly. Well, they didn't know that it was over, but but Hood wants to threaten Sherman's supply lines. But it's not really working, so he kind of decides to be bold and, and late in the game, and he really tries to really almost throw like a Hail Mary. You know, and he ain't yeah. Doug Flutie Mary. He ain't going to connect on that Hail Mary. That's <laughs> just the way it is, guys. Okay? Not the, not the, but, and really, and this kind of goes into the next phase of this, which is going to be the final phase, the final chapter of Granberry. This 30,000 man Union Army of the Ohio under John Schofield is marching up to link with George Thomas's army of the Cumberland in Nashville, Tennessee. And Hood wants to destroy Schofield before he can get there and then finish off Thomas in Nashville. And so Hood really, what he's it's a pretty bold plan. Hood is going to march his army of, of Tennessee through central Alabama with Nashville in his sights, which was the Union supply hub at the time. Now, we're not going to talk about the whole thing, but this it's Spring Hill, Tennessee. You know, Hood's army missed out on a plan to really trap Schofield. Again, you know, we did that previous episode on Spring Hill. I know we did that one. I remember doing that one. Yeah, we so did check, Franklin. So, so, so check it out. But suffice it to say again. What happened and whose fault it was is controversial. It's, he said, she said. We're not going to get into that. But if Hood, the thing about it is, if Hood bags Schofield there, it really doesn't change anything in the big no. picture because it's all window dressing. And I, the, the failure at Spring Hill was overblown. And also, the thing about that though is blaming Hood one hundred percent for Spring Hill is really a disservice to Schofield. Yeah, who really, who really should get more credit for getting past Hood Absolutely. than Hood let him get by. I mean, sometimes the mouse getting by the cat deserves the credit, right? Yep. Not the I cat agree. falling asleep. Just, just saying. But the one thing that is true was that Hood was pissed off at the failure 
It's Spring Hill. And whether it was the fault of Hood, it was a fault of Benjamin Cheatham, Patrick Claiborne, Rosewood's clown. It doesn't matter whose fault it is, okay? <laughs> it's 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 the it's debated to this day. Yeah. And, and that's what's gonna happen after Spring Hill. And it's gonna there's gonna be an it's gonna be some name game, name uh, blame game yeah. stuff rather that's gonna involve Granberry. Yeah, and that's the thing is like we don't know what was said. We don't know a hundred percent who was blamed in that meeting after spring hill there are reports that say that hood outright blamed you know cheatham brown and claiborne for it there's stories that granberry's name came up as well there is a story that hood called them cowards we don't a hundred percent know because there are so many different stories and that's the thing with studying this that's the thing with studying this history is it's you know these accounts are all from people who were there but they're all different. Um, and, you know, Granberry is going to go march towards Franklin and he's going to be described by his men as being very agitated, being very angry. Um, Claiborne is the same way as well. Um, and, you know, whether they were called cowards, we'll, we will never know. But if, you know, if they were, this would explain the anger that they had this would be you know and even if they are being blamed of course they're going to be angry and of course men like Claiborne and Granberry are going to think my men don't deserve this you know um like there's just but like the the story of Spring Hill and Franklin is really interesting from like a historical memory perspective because there as you said there's so much blame game going on and when they get to Franklin when Granberry's men are told to line up by that Winsteed Winsteed Hill they take one look at it and they look across to the the union line and they i think they knew like well i mean i think no the, way there's no way no but for, for for whatever reason it reminds me a little bit of and, 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 and people talk about franklin they mistakenly call it pickets charge of the west and that's that's so a, much that, worse right, than but, right right but the, but the thing about the hoods on winstead hill and he's looking at the union line right yeah. now the, let's yeah. just let's set the stage real quick what they have okay schofield you know Hood's going to march that army 13 miles north from Spring Hill to Franklin, yeah. right? And Schofield, for the most part, is dug in in a defensive position in Franklin, Tennessee, because – and he's benefited by some breastworks and, and entrenchments that were there previously. So they have a ready-made defense. Yeah. The question is why didn't Schofield just keep going? And it's because the bridge that crossed over the Harpeth River was down. And they needed to have engineers fix the bridge so they can go across. In the meantime, they had to set up a defense to get ready for the oncoming army of Tennessee. The Battle of Franklin happens because the bridge is down. And that's kind of what happens with that. Yeah. But but the stage is set, though, for this bloodletting. That'll be the Battle of Franklin. And Granberry's Texas are going to find themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. But, but from Winstead Hill, though, Hood sees that open field of about a mile, mile or two, leading to the Union lines. And he's going to decide for whatever reason, you know, he, you know, this talk that he thought maybe the union was weak in the middle. That's why he hit there. But yeah. for whatever, whatever reason, he felt that to attack the union position across an open field was a good idea. History is going to say it was a bad idea. Jeans commercial. Right. But going agree. forward. But that's what it was, though. <laughs> Yeah. Obviously, but the thing about it, not, not to defend Hood, but obviously Hood felt for whatever reason the Union line was vulnerable. Yep. He's not he's not stupid. I mean, he's aggressive, but he's not he's not stupid. If he's not going to attack, knowing he's going to get beat, he's going to attack because he thinks he can win, and that's why he does it. So, but for the most part, through that field, okay, it, it's 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 large, but most of the that he has to go. But most of the bloodshed is going to take place around 500 yards to the Union line. Yeah. It's going to be close hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And for the most part, Hood is – his motivation to make the attack, like we said, is up, it's up for debate. People say it back and forth but um, by, by his supporters and his detractors alike. Now, Claiborne's division, which is going to have – is going to have the Texas Brigade and Granberry – is going to be basically right in the middle. They're going to attack right up the Columbia Pike, right? Yeah. Right. On, okay. Granberry's brigade is going to be in the middle of that division, and he's going to. They're going to get right up to the Union line. We're going to talk about the details of the battle, but Granberry, he's going to sprint ahead, and he's going to yell to his men, "What?" He's going to say, "Forward, men! Never let it be said that Texans lag in a fight." 
And it, that you can dissect that line a million different ways. Oh, yeah. Because because you can you can you 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 can think okay, Ford men never let it be said that Texans lag in the fight. So in his mind, he feels that the Texans have been accused of being lagging. Yep. Right. It, it reminds you a lot of Richard Garnett at Gettysburg. Yes. A lot of them. So for whatever reason, Granberry has he's like many of these guys, he feels he's in this position, you know, at George Lamb Willard at Gettysburg. He's gonna prove himself. You know, yeah. he's he, he's had issues in the past where he's felt disrespected. Today's gonna be my day. Was it a death wish that he did what he did? Or was it, a, was it to reclaim the reputation of him and his Texans? I think he cared about his men, but also he's, you know, he's put everything he has into this army. He's lost his wife. He's mourning right. her. Um, I think there is a bit of that, like, you know, if I die, maybe I'll be back with her again. You know, who knows what it what it was, but it's, I think it it's also the pride, the whole... Oh. Um, and also wow. it, it shows his leadership ability as well, because I think he took one look at that position and was like, no, the F way, are we going to be able mm -hmm. to take that? So if I want my men to do it, I'm going to have to go forward with them. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think it's that yeah. I also, I, I don't personally, I don't think it's any more complicated that he felt his men were disrespected by somebody was probably hood because yeah. Claiborne felt the same way. Yeah. He felt the same way. So he felt they had to prove themselves. So, you know, basically after you know, after the battle, the Texans talked about the confusion of this battle because smoke filled the air. Nobody could see anything. It was dark. Uh, they were firing at flashes of light from the Union muskets ahead. And Granberry is going to get to about a hundred feet from reaching the center of, uh, of of the line at the Carter House, right? And after after making it across that mile field, that smoky open field. And this is going to be the end of Hiram Granberry, okay? Yeah. At that moment, a cannonball is going to rip the top of his skull, and he's going to cause him to cover his face with his hands and fall to his knees. The cannonball took the top part of his head off, and he died immediately, just 33 years old. The Marsh of Franklin, and here's the interesting story about this, too, is you read some of the soldier stories. And I probably should have said this before, but the March to Franklin apparently destroyed Granberry's boots, and he was almost barefoot walking. Yeah. And so a major farm Walt is going to offer to let him wear his brand new boots into battle. Wow. And farm Walt's going to is, is said Granberry, you know, he saw the boots and says yes. And he, he says Granberry offered to break them in for me, was what he said. But he was wearing. <laughs> But he was wearing them when he was killed. Now, you know, the thing is, when these Texans, these beaten and distraught, distraught men, found him after the battle, this is according to a Lieutenant Mangum, um, who was right near Granbury when he fell, said his dead body was on his knees with his hands still clutching his face as if he was frozen in time. Yeah. That's how they found his body. And, you know, again, five other Confederates are going to be killed or morally wounded at this Battle of Franklin. But again, that you got to imagine um, the sight of that for his men. Yeah, like finding him there and he's just like frozen in time like that as he fell. Like that's got to be so creepy. And again, in doing the research for this episode, that this one paper I read recounts the Battle of Franklin in really, oh. it's very detailed um, you know, the men going forward and Granberry with them. It it's such a horrific battle. I can't even like imagine the chaos and the confusion that it's just, you know, it's what four and a half, five hours long. And um just you have and Granberry's gonna be laid out on the front porch or on the porch with um he's gonna be with Clayburn and Othel Strahl. And who else is there? Adams as well. They're all they're there gonna be late. They'll they'll be laid on, on the porch. It'll be Claiborne, Adams, Otho, Straw. They're, they're all they're gonna be laying there on the the porch of that Carrington house, right? Yep. And, and they talked about the men. They saw their dead bodies. They were openly weeping as they saw all of them. Um, and and it's it the the, uh, the battle of Franklin fails. Uh, you know, Schofield's going to get across. He's going to leave the battle of Nashville. They're going to get beat again. Hood's going to fall back. That's going to be the end of it. But the thing about it is, Granberry. You know, after that, he's going to be buried near the Franklin battlefield at a place yeah. called McGavick Cemetery, and he'll be moved to a place called St. John's Episcopal Church about 30 miles away. And this is the same cemetery that Patrick Claiborne was originally mm -hmm. buried in. 
because he saw it and loved the church and th- thought yeah, he I'm told gonna, um you know, lucius polk that that he loved the church yeah. he loved the church and if he was killed he'd love to be buried there that's yeah. what he said and so they they you know they, they did it and he's gonna granberry is gonna end up being buried in this place for a long time about uh, about 30 years he's gonna be there for 29 years until november 30th of 1893 when a friend of his from texas a guy named claber van zandt Mm-hmm. Not, not, no bigger Texan name than Claiborne Van Zandt. Van Zandt. Okay? <laughs> right. He's going to arrange to have his remains re- uh, returned home to, to the town of Granbury, Texas, a, sound, uh, a small town southwest of Fort Worth that was founded in 1860 and, of course, was named after Hiram Granbury. And ironically, the town of Granbury is in Hood County named after who? John Bell John Hood. Bell Hood. So there you go. So he's he's reporting to Hood for eternity in his towns, right? I don't know how right? Hiram Granberry would feel. About <laughs> I don't know. That. But here's here's a here's a here's a fun fact though. How, for those who follow the John Wilkes Booth set, if, if the, the John Wilkes Booth thing, the people who say that he survived Garrett's farm, Granberry, Texas, is the town that that Booth, under the name of John St. Helen, had lived in for a while. He lived in a place called the Nutshell Eatery. OK, which is now called a square cafe. I've been there. Right. Um, <laughs> but but that's a if you, if Granberry's got a lot of weird history with that. But Granberry is buried today in Granberry Cemetery in Granberry, Texas. And when they moved his body from St. John's Episcopal, you know what they did? They moved the original gravestone, which is kind of rare. Yeah. The original the original gravestone, how they spell his last name. Uh, with the two R's. Grand Berry. Berry, yeah. Right? Now, Avenger, it's been since replaced. It says Grand Berry today, but his original gravestone saying Grand Berry was transferred original. And I can't think of too many situations in history where they did that. They did the, it's no, interesting. I think they gave Claiborne a new one. Um, and the other thing, too, um, so his wife, when when she died, um, Grand Berry could not afford a headstone for her. So she was buried in an unmarked grave um recent research allowed people to find her grave and she now has a marker that says fanny mm-hmm. sims granberry on it but she's unfortunately not buried with her um with no. her husband which is sad and i think that's because she doesn't have any descendants or something that can approve the yeah, moving she... of it which i'm like just move her to let well, her it, it... Her, her, know, her, the, story, the story of her body and her grave is fascinating like i said before fanny is mysterious her entire life in her in her death she's still mysterious mysterious she's buried in a private unmarked plot paid for by a family called the redmond family uh, which is likely a family friend um an unmarked grave in a place called magnolia cemetery in mobile alabama right um poverty for different reasons the month there was no money like you said to give her a gravestone she didn't yeah. have one and she was on. She was missing for a century. I was gone in June of two thousand and one, not too long ago. Mary, think about it. A search began by a researcher named Mary Evans Johnson. Mm-hmm. So she was hell bent on finding her grave site. And so, in January two thousand two, um, her burial records were finally found by this Johnson. Johnson found several pieces of lost information that were lost to history, including the location of her grave. Her death certificate, her obituary that was found at Auburn University, all places. That's where wow. she found the stuff, noting ovarian cancer as her cause of death. The problem, like you said, there were no descendants alive today to authorize Fanning's exhumation and, and reburial in Granbury, Texas with Hiram. So today, to this date, her body still remains in Mobile. That is so but sad. They, but they pay, but they finally gave her a headstone anyway. So yeah. at least her body's there. But for the most part, sadly, it seems that Fanny, this is a woman who did everything possible to stay near Hiram in life, can't be with him in death yeah. because of because of red tape. Right. So sad. It's, it, it's, it's just it's just a sad. I don't know. Twist. It's kind of like I read that and I'm so frustrated. It's like just like, oh, my God, like, why do you need permission? Do you think someone's going to come along and get in like, oh, my God, you moved my great aunt or something? It's like, well, I don't know. let her be with her husband. Like, I don't know. I it's tough to say what I wanted. <laughs> No, but 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 the thing about it though is Granberry's death had a big impact. It had a big impact to his Masonic Lodge of Waco too. Yeah. It, April eighth of eighteen sixty five, which is right around the time of Appomattox, Mary, right around that same time, right? Yeah. Um, Granberry's Masonic Lodge number ninety two in Texas 
they, it's it, it, I look up their minutes and they actually had a mi- information entered into their official minutes about Hiram Granberry. Wow. And Hiram Granberry at that point was a, had the position of senior warden, which Whoa. basically means he was next in line to the master of the lodge. He was next in line. Wow. The minutes of April 8th, 1865 in the Masonic Lodge number 92, this is what they wrote. Whereas the Battle of Franklin, Tennessee, it pleased the supreme ruler of the universe to remove from us by death our esteemed and worthy brother, General Hiram Bronson Granberry. Resolved by the death of our brother, the country in its hour of peril has to lament one of its ablest defenders, society, one of its brightest ornaments. This lodge, one of the most esteemed and worthy brothers in Freemasonry, one of its most zealous and worthy sons. Wow. That, that's what that was right on the lodge of April 18th, 1865. So again, it goes back to what? That leadership ability, yeah. how much impact this guy had and how his untimely death at age 33 is one of the great what ifs for reconstruction. Uh, he, he, he's somebody who, especially in Texas, would have been very instrumental. But again, we'll never know. We'll never know. No. No, it's a lot like Claiborne, and he was good friends with Claiborne. He was close. All of them in that, you know, the Claiborne's division. You had Low was it Lowry, um, Lucius Polk, Granberry. I mean, you had like, you you had you had a tough tough group of guys, and and they were fighters. But he he again he he rose up, and I think he's somebody who I think people know who he is tangentially anyway but when you really get into the weeds and look at this guy you realize a pained soul someone who carried grief throughout the war and died a real real tragic death yeah. and, and, and it's and really we said before franklin is very unnecessary so so i think i think um it's great to talk about him there's not a lot of people who talk about Hiram granberry but no. i think he's I, th- I think he's someone who's important to study because it, you know what it, it add, again it adds a face it adds it adds a person to this this picture and the picture that we mentioned is a sad picture because when you look at that picture he made this picture because he wanted his wife to have it yeah. when she died because he wasn't going to be there that's the genesis of this picture and so when you see it the one with the big crazy hair that's why that's why he took the picture for that her. It wasn't so some sad. so it's sad. It's sad. So yeah. But anyway, it's great so... to tell his story because you know, north or south, these guys are human. Um, they have lives. I mean, he had a wife um uh, who clearly they loved each other a lot. They were I think they were each other's best friends, just from what I've read about them. She's going to war with him, like John Brown Gordon's wife went to war with him. She's crossing icy rivers for him and You know, I think at the end of the day, he like, you know, he went back after she died and he just was like, I have to fight because that's what she would have wanted me to do. I think she really encouraged, like, you know, she kind of encouraged the whole like, yeah, you have to keep going sort of thing. And that's all he had was his men in the seventh Texas um, and what became, you know, beyond that, obviously, but he's a great leader. He has a lot of leadership skills that, you know, leading his men at Franklin, like that's. That's baller. It's, it's, it's tough. That's, it's tough. Like, geez, mm-hmm. that's baller right there. But it I'm is. really glad we did an episode about him because he is one of those, he's one of those stories that just does not get talked about enough. Nope. And he's such a fascinating story. It is. Well. So this is where I usually ask you what's next for us. Right. So, you know, so we'll have to figure something out. We got some, we got some our next perfect. episode will probably be in 2024, honestly, because be. we have Christmas coming up and all that, but yeah, we will, um, we will be announcing book club stuff soon. Hopefully, um, we will be announce hopefully another round table where we can hang out mm-hmm. and stuff with y'all. Um, but yeah, thank you for all of your support. These 120 episodes. Thank you, Darren, for being an amazing co-host. Oh yeah. Well, we'll have it's it's it's, it's a great thing to do. It um uh, it's fun. There's a lot of other history going on. Mary, tomorrow is a 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party, where 116 of Boston's bravest Freemasons dumped the King's Tea into the salty sea. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, mm-hmm. participate in that tomorrow as part of my lodge. We're gonna have some fun doing that. So we will look forward to to, to that. But uh, again, uh, everybody listen, we appreciate your support. Have a great holiday. Uh, enjoy. Uh, hopefully, you have a lot of time with your family. I know it's a tough time for a lot of people, but 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 um, find find the joy any way you can, with whatever it happens to be. Your your people, you know, your people are always supported, and it's great to uh, it's great to be able to do this with you, Mary. So off Thank we you. go. 
So again, we appreciate it. So off we go, guys. Have a great, uh, have a great holiday. Have a great weekend. And we don't forget the YouTube live tomorrow, Mary. We can do that. And then we are off to Gettysburg for a couple of weeks ourselves. We so we'll are for have some fun. So hopefully doing we'll, that, we so. will probably, like I said, we're doing our our YouTube live stream tomorrow. But we'll try and do one while we're in Gettysburg as well. And we will be back um, sometime in January, hopefully early January, with um, probably a battle episode. I think yep, we we'll, need to get we'll back to some battles. Fun. Find something fun to do. All yeah. right. Any final words from you, Fincheru? Thank you for bringing it as always. Um, and thank you again to all our listeners. Y'all are awesome. And don't forget, there's no basement in the Alamo. <laughs> anyway, we'll see y'all next time. Bye. Peace out, everybody. Bye. Bye.